nations arise and thunders roar. I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us and we pray God's blessing on your life. If there's any way that we can serve, support and strengthen you, then please do get in contact with us. All our contact details will be on the stream. I want to ask you a question as we start today. Have you ever been asked to do something that you think is impossible? Maybe a child or a, a family member who's a, a child has come up to you and said, can you please, or would you, or could you? And maybe it's made you chuckle because you think, oh, I, I, I admire your faith in me, but really that's impossible, I can't do that. Or maybe you've been uh, given a, a job by your spouse and you think, I can't do that. Maybe going to have to pay to get someone to do that, or that's going to have to wait. I just can't do that. Or maybe even you think God has asked you to do something 
that you think is impossible. Well, if that's the case of any of our experience, then today's verse is really going to help you. Because in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul says something that for many people they will throw their hands up in the air and say, that's impossible. <laughs> Paul says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been thinking about the fact that there's more to life than anxiety and we've used this little acrostic cam to describe how we can experience God's presence in the midst of it. And the first of that is that we can celebrate God's goodness. We recognise that He is a sovereign God who is in control. Today we're going to look at asking God for help. Helping us understand what He's teaching but also transform our heart in daily lives. And then over the next couple of weeks we're going to look at this idea of leaving your concerns with God and meditating or, or thinking about the right things. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So Paul uses three words that are very similar but have very distinct meanings when he's talking about prayer and, and why we can have that peace in the middle of it. So our first one suggests this to us. Asking God for help with anxiety involves prayer. When Paul uses the word prayer, it's the most common word for prayer in the New Testament, used at least 127 times in all its various forms. And in every single circumstance, it's this idea of up close, intimate, personal connection with God, which is an astounding thought. In the Bible, in the, in the Gospels, John chapter 1, we, we get this insight, this revelation of that being the, the very nature of God. The Bible says in John 1 verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The word there is a reference to Jesus Christ who then came into flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. But the word was with God. One, one version says that the word, i.e. Jesus, was face to face with God. It's that idea of an intimate relationship that existed in God. And he also wants to, to show us and tell us that we can have that re in, intimate relationship with God too. Part of the verse was, was used to de depict a person with some kind of vow or a need or a desire to get a need met in his life. And, and that individual would, would vow to give something of great value to a God, to an idol, in exchange for an answer to prayer. And so one of the core ideas is this idea of exchange. That as we give God our concerns and our anxieties and our worries, which may be real and they may be present... But we have this sense of exchange that God can come and give us his, his peace. And so that's the basic idea. That the worries and the burdens that we are carrying through the pressures of life, through the pressures of lockdown. That Paul says one of the first steps in experiencing his peace is that we give those things to God. That we come and bring all that we are, all that we're struggling with to God in that sense of intimate face-to-face -face relationship with him you can give him your worries you can give him your fears you can give him your concerns and then ask god to give you something back in exchange give his peace and that sense of connection is crucial in the in understanding what jesus came to do he came to bring us back into relationship to restore us to reconcile us and 
when we're not in that state of connection, it affects us spiritually, it affects us physically, it affects us emotionally. Dr. Edmund Byrne, or Bourne, is a noted psychologist and researcher for over 30 years, and he became an award-winning specialist in this area of anxiety. And he makes an interesting observation when he says that anxiety arises from a state of disconnection. I know pastorally that's true. I know relationally that's true. So my encouragement to you, whatever stage you are in your relationship with God, wherever you are in your journey, that you listen to this advice, that you come and you bring things to God in prayer, in that relationship. Second thing, second word that Paul says to us is that asking God for help with our anxiety involves petition. Now, we live in an age of online petition. I get requests for them regularly. You probably do too. And it can be very easy if we have a smartphone, a couple of little clicks, fill in a small amount of information, and we've added ourselves to a petition. That's not what Paul is talking about here. He's talking about someone who has some form of of lack in his life and is, is pleading strongly for his need to be met. It's almost a place of desperation. It's a place where someone who, because of their great need, feels compelled to push it against their pride, push it out of the way and boldly, sincerely, strongly, passionately cry out for help. You may have had to do that in these in this last year. I know a lot of people have said as they've gone to food banks and other circumstances, they never thought they would have to ask for help in this way. One of those powerful examples in the Bible is found in James chapter 5 verse 16 and it says that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And the verses surrounding that talks about a man called Elijah who prayed and it didn't rain for three and a half years in the land. And then the Bible says he prayed again and the rains came. And that's powerful, effective prayers that changes the course of weather and change the course of a nation dependent on rains and agriculture. But James says something interesting too. He says, Elijah was a man with passions just like us. In other words, Elijah was an ordinary person. He was an ordinary man. He had strengths and weaknesses. He had feelings. He messed up at times, he got depressed, he he wanted to run away from God at times because of intimidation from other people. But God said of him that he was a man just like this and yet his prayers were powerful. And God knows that that passionate and persistent prayer is sometimes what we need because it comes out of that strong desire to get needs met. It's whatever we're facing in life, we can bring it to God. Elijah wasn't a superhero out of our league he was an ordinary person Jesus himself tells a story to encourage us to think about praying and being persistent and petitioning him and he tells the story of of a widow who came to an unjust judge and she kept coming back to him and kept coming back to him and he wasn't bothered Luke chapter 18 he wasn't bothered about her Jesus said But because she was persistent, because she kept petitioning him, in the end, he gave her justice. And Jesus said, even if that unjust judge will give justice, how much more will God give you justice? So he's contrasting an unjust judge with a God who he describes as our Heavenly Father, who who says we can have that one-to-one relationship, that personal, intimate relationship with him. So we can come and bring those petitions for us. There's no reason for us to be timid when we pray. We can tell God exactly what we feel. We can tell him what we're facing. We can tell what we're asking to do. But as we bring that petition, there's also something we should do. It's with thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but I I didn't like it when my kids were ungrateful if I gave them something. If you've ever handed something to your kid and they've just taken it and you say hang on have you forgotten to say something oh thank you because we don't want 
people to respond and be ungrateful. Do you know what? God's the same. He doesn't want us to be ungrateful. He wants us to recognize his goodness, recognize his grace and his mercy in our life, recognize what he wants to do. The giving of thanks for God's grace is literally what that word means. Where have you experienced God's grace and God's goodness in your life? Maybe you're sitting with the person who's helped you experience that. By supporting you, by helping you, by encouraging you, by strengthening you, by standing beside you. Hopefully you have someone who will be there for you. God's grace can make those people available in our our life. And for Paul, this wasn't just someone in an ivory tower, someone who was isolated, someone who didn't really know what he was talking about. As these people in Philippians are hearing Paul, as the, the letters read out to them or as they're reading it, then they would have known how he suffered because he was in prison in Philippi. The Bible records that even in the midst of that prison, at midnight, he sang hymn of praise to God with his fellow prisoner. Incredible. With thanksgiving, present your requests. That's why Paul is able to say, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We don't give thanks for everything. We don't call what is bad good. That, that's not what he's saying. But in the circumstances, we can give thanks. Because we, if we allow it, it will train us. It will develop our character. It will develop perseverance and resilience. It will mature our faith. The third word that Paul uses is requests. And this is what he says. Asking God for help with anxiety involves requests. The word request destroys any religious suggestion that you're kind of a lowly worm that's no right to come into God's presence. Sometimes we carry a sense of shame. Maybe shame over things we've done in the past. Maybe parts of our history we wouldn't want others to know. Maybe things we're currently struggling with and finding it difficult to acknowledge even before God. God says we don't have to have that shame. We don't have to have that condemnation. We're not lowly worms. We are created in the image of God, made to be in relationship with him. And in the New Testament, the word that's used is a word of, of someone who's coming to a superior, but coming, yes, with respect and honor, but coming with boldness, expecting a specific need to be met. Expresses the idea that what we want to receive we fully expect to get there's a great story in the gospel of john chapter 11 where jesus is about to raise lazarus from the dead and mary doesn't know that but mary's been grief stricken she's had loss and she sent word to jesus but it seemed he put himself in lockdown and delayed his visit even longer So by the time he came to the tomb, Lazarus was dead four days and they had this debate over, you're too late, Jesus. But Mary, in a conversation with Jesus, gets an insight from Jesus and and this is the declaration she makes in John chapter 11, verse 22. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. What an incredible insight from Mary. To know that when we bring a concern to God, we can have boldness. We can pray with authority. If our request is based on the word of God and the will of God, we can have the assurance of God's promises. When we pray, it is appropriate for us to expect God to honor his word. In fact, he says, put me in remembrance of the things that I have promised. You see, we don't have to fall into a downward spiral of anxiety over difficult difficult circumstances. They will come and there will be challenging seasons. There will be times where we're tipped to move over from concern about a situation into anxiety. And one of the differences between concern and anxiety is 
what are we responsible for? See, there's some things we should be concerned about. I'm rightly concerned about my children, even though they're adults. But how they live their life isn't ultimately my responsibility. They make choices. They have to do things according to their circumstances and life choices. I can't worry about those things. I'm concerned, but I don't have to worry. So maybe you in your situation, with your circumstances, maybe you can pray a prayer something like this and bring in your prayers that close, intimate, one-to-one with God and bring in that petition that you may have to come back to God repeatedly and say, come on God, I need you to help me. And maybe that sense of request, not because we're a lowly worm, but because we're made in the image of God. God is our Father who longs to show us grace in our life. So maybe a prayer, something like this, is appropriate for you. Heavenly Father, I bring my problems and circumstances to you. The situation is beyond my control and influence And I'm tempted to feel helpless. But you have the power to change my heart and the circumstances of my life. I know that you love me perfectly. And whatever you have planned for me is for my own good. Show me how to respond. And I will choose to obey you. I ask for you to show me your love, your wisdom and your power. And I pray this. In the name of Jesus. Those are just sample words. You can bring a prayer like that to God using your own words. If you want to dig a little bit deeper, then we have an option for you. I have a worksheet that I I put together that will help you consider how you can move towards resolving persistent anxiety in your life. If that's something that you feel would be helpful for you, then get in touch with us. We'd love to help. All our contact information will come on the stream. The second thing that you can also do is make some inquiries about the wellbeing group, two of which uh, I've already started, and um, we can put you on the next one that we plan to do. So whether you want the worksheet or whether you want to, uh, to get in- connected with the wellbeing group, and please get in contact with us. Thank you for being with us. We pray God's blessing on you today as you enjoy the rest of the stream. Thank you. I work in fashion. I own a fashion store. I curate different independent designers and different brands from all over the world. We came up with this phrase, which was, our hearts needed to be as transparent as our shop window. We wanted our business to reflect our love for people and God's love for us. I'm the eldest of my siblings. We was brought up in faith in Christ. I was just told about the do's and don'ts of a Christian, the rules. I really started to understand Christ in me. Once I went to university, started really understanding that my relationship with Christ wasn't a ritual, it was actually more of a relationship. When everything feels like it's falling apart or when I feel like I'm struggling financially or I'm struggling with growth, I always still feel centred. I've never known anything else than to rely on my faith when things are going wrong around me. Jesus is ahead of us and not worrying about tomorrow and really understanding what Jesus is trying to do through us now and today. That reassurance, that feeling centered can only come from something bigger than me. That's how I feel Christ's presence. That's how I feel that Jesus is walking along this journey with me. I'm called to do this by God and I'm called to do this as a vocation and Christ through me. We should learn to walk freely 
The only thing that holds us back from walking freely is fear, anxiety, rejection, and, and all those things that Jesus died for. We should learn to align ourselves with our purpose, regardless of how fearful it looks, because God's love can hold us together. Jesus Christ.